So here, who, who here likes drama? Anyone? Got Renee in the back? <laughs> well, most of us, I tend, I think, tend to like drama in our TV shows. That's probably why there's this whole category on my Netflix called drama. Um, and the premise of most entertaining TV shows is, I think, the drama and the conflict. Um, Game of Thrones just wouldn't be Game of Thrones if no one was fighting for the throne. Um, if at the beginning they just like gave it to Daenerys because they're like, well, clearly you're the best choice. And everyone's like, yeah, we're cool with that. Daenerys, you take the throne. Um, I doubt the show would be quite as much of a cultural phenomenon as it is now. Or in The Bachelor, say there weren't 25 girls all fighting for the affections of one man, but he simply asked one girl on a date and we watched that date, the show would probably not be quite as entertaining. Um, but despite how much we love drama and conflict and tension and misunderstandings and raging feelings in our entertainment, not many of us find it so entertaining when it's happening in our own lives. Drama with friends, that stinks. Family drama, also rough. Drama with coworkers or classmates or your boss, not fun at all. I think that drama is one of those things that's best observed from afar, like a skunk. <laughs> Super cute from far away, right? But not so much fun close up. <laughs> it's fun to watch drama when it's happening to other people, ideally fictional people you don't actually know, but it's not so much fun when you're stuck in the middle of it. You find yourself fighting with your best friends, people are being hurtful and cold and mean to each other, or you suddenly just stop being friends with people because the drama is just too much. As we continue our series on friending, we've gotten to the point where we've realized that friendships are important and worth investing in. We've learned how to be a good friend and what it takes to build a friendship from the ground up. But now we have to learn how to keep those friends. We have to figure out how to work through the drama, how to avoid the drama. Because you see, no matter how awesome our new friends are that we've made, or how amazing of a friend that we are in the relationship, any relationship that persists for any length of time will have conflict. And if we don't figure out how to maturely deal with conflict in a Christ-like way, we will always find ourselves in friendships that remain surface level, that just never seem to last that fizzle out, blow up, or drift apart. So let's get started and make some drama. First off, we have to ask ourselves a very important question. Why even engage in conflict in the first place? Doesn't conflict mean that we're just not that compatible, that this friendship probably won't make it anyway? Isn't it just easier to walk away from relationships that have drama in them? Aren't we not supposed to fight as followers of Jesus? Let's take a look at these questions and discovering, discover why engaging in conflict is crucial to our social, emotional, and spiritual health. Okay, number one, why engage in conflict? Because conflict will never stop existing. The Bible tells us that conflict is one of the results of sin and brokenness, and that it emerged way back at the beginning with Adam and Eve after they sinned. Now, before sin, Adam and Eve didn't have any conflict with each other. It was the perfect relationship. But after disobeying God and breaking that relationship with him, the perfect relationship that they had shared also broke. We see this brokenness on both sides of the relationship. In Genesis 3, 11, 12, 3, 11 through 12, we read, Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. The blame game. Conflict right off the bat. As soon as he and Eve sinned, Adam starts having conflict with Eve and blaming her all over the place. Instead of loving her and standing united with her, he blames her and there's conflict. Now in Genesis 3.16, we see that Eve's relationship is also broken with Adam. It's not just one-sided. So this is God telling Eve the natural consequences of her sin. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Essentially, you will have conflict. An inherent consequence of human sin and brokenness is conflict with others. We no longer have a perfect relationship with God or with our fellow human beings because of our own brokenness. And as long as two imperfect people exist, 
there will be conflict. Now, a lot of people believe that conflict is a sign of unhealth or that something is bad or it's not working. And that's true to some degree, um, because if we weren't broken, if we were perfect, then there wouldn't be conflict. But unfortunately, no unbroken person exists. The Bible tells us for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if you think, well, this friendship has conflict, or these people have conflict, or this community has conflict, I should just move on and find something that doesn't have any conflict. You will never find a friend or a community. A place or a friendship without conflict is literally not humanly possible. And even if you somehow manage to defy all the laws of spirituality and truth and what the Bible tells us about conflict, and you found this perfect community that didn't have any conflict, the moment you joined it, it would suddenly have conflict. Because you're broken, and you bring conflict into whatever relationship you are in. We have to engage with conflict, because there is no place or friendship or relationship that won't have conflict. And if you spend your life trying to run from it or find a friendship without it, you will be running for the whole rest of your life. All right, so number two, why engage with conflict? Because as the people of God, we are called to live at peace with one another. First Corinthians 1.10 tells us, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Paul's encouragement for the church over and over again in the New Testament is to be unified. Where the fall created brokenness and discord and hate between people, we are called to move towards unity, towards peace and love. And that means that we have to deal with conflict so we can then be unified. And the Bible is clear that this work of peace and unity is to be a top priority for us. It tells us over and over to make every effort towards peace. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live at peace with everyone and to be holy. Romans 14, 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Dealing with conflict so that we can be unified and at peace with our friends and families and others is not a maybe when I get around to it, or maybe when I feel like it, or maybe when it's not so hard kind of thing. It's an integral call. It's an integral part of our call as Christians to love God and love others. And when we actually engage with conflict and make every effort to peace and unity, guess what? We discover the gift of joy. Proverbs 12, 20 tells us, deceit is in the hearts of those who plot evil, but those who promote peace have joy. Why engage with conflict? Because as the people of God, we are called to live at peace with one another. And when we live in peace, our lives are just way more joyful. And who doesn't want that? All right, lastly, why engage in conflict? Because peace does not mean ignoring conflict. Now, perhaps you're familiar with the famous verse from Matthew. Jesus tells us, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Jesus says we should be peacemakers. But how do we do that? We often interpret this scripture and those previous scriptures about peace based on our cultural or familial understandings of peace. Believing that peace means staying quiet, not disagreeing, keeping your opinions to yourself, pretending your feelings aren't hurt when they actually are ignoring conflict, brushing things under the rug. While this is in line with our culture's interpretation of peace, this is not at all how the Bible presents peace. Let's take a look at Jesus. If anyone is someone who's the ultimate peacemaker, the ultimate person who did life right, it was Jesus. So what did Jesus do? Did Jesus ignore conflict or brush it under the rug or keep quiet about his feelings? Did Jesus ever disagree with someone? Yes, he did. Jesus cleared the temple. Jesus had strong words over and over for the Pharisees and religious leaders. Jesus rebuked Peter. Jesus said no to the crowds in his family. Jesus engaged with conflict. Jesus consistently had conflict with other people. Jesus did not ignore conflict or pretend that it didn't exist or run away from it. Jesus moved into the discomfort of conflict 
and engaging with conflict and dealing with conflict rather than ignoring it. Jesus promoted true peace, not false peace. In his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, author Peter Scazzaro writes, when we pretend that something doesn't exist that does, conflict, hurt feelings, disappointed expectations, differences of opinion, we live in lies. When we ignore conflict or avoid conflict rather than engaging with it, we pretend something doesn't exist that does. We live in lies and true peace can never be upholding a lie. When Jesus engaged with conflict, he demonstrated for us that true peace involves working through our differences and disagreements rather than simply ignoring them. So why engage with conflict? Because peace does not mean ignoring conflict. So the big question, why engage with conflict? One, because it will never stop existing because everyone is broken. Two, because as the people of God, we are called to live at peace with one another and be moving towards unity. And three, because peace does not mean ignoring conflict. All right, so I wanna stop here and make a brief terminology distinction that I think is important before we move on. When we talk about conflict, I wanna hone in on that meaning a little bit because conflict can mean a lot of different things for different people. But straight conflict, as we're talking about, is simply the natural differences between people that bump up against each other in life. Now this happens because people aren't mind readers, people aren't perfect clones and thoughts and tastes and desires. You wanna to go to Buffalo Wild Wings, I wanna to go to Gandhi's, that's a conflict. Um, I'm right, you're wrong, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> we want different things, we think different things, and that's totally okay. There's nothing inherently good or bad in these differences between people, they just are. And these natural differences will bump up against each other in all situations where two people interact. And this sort of like not being on the same page with each other is conflict. Now what matters then is how we deal with that conflict. How we deal with the fact that you wanna to go to Buffalo Wild Wings and I wanna to go to the far superior establishment of Gandhi's. When we don't handle being on the same page well, um, when I scream and cry about not going to Gandhi's, that's called discord. Discord is not dealing with conflict. Letting conflict go unresolved or festering, handling conflict negatively. Now peace, on the other hand, is when we deal with the bumps in the road appropriately in a positive, mature, Christ-like way, working towards unity with others. So to clarify, conflict in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It's just the natural differences between two human beings and it will always happen when two people interact. However, how we then deal with these natural differences is either good or bad. We can either create discord, the negative effects of unresolved conflict, or we can create peace, the positive effects of resolved conflict. So let's see what the Bible can teach us about conflict. Romans 12, 18 tells us, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I think this verse is really important for two reasons when we're talking about conflict. Number one, it acknowledges that we can't control other people and that even though conflict exists between two people, we can only control our own actions and responses in the face of conflict. Now it can be easy during conflict to play the victim game to say the other person is just so unreasonable or they're so hurtful or they're the one who's causing all the conflict. If they weren't causing the conflict, we wouldn't have any. Um, you know, some people are unreasonable, that's true. It might be you. Um, but this attitude eliminates your own agency and the call that we have biblically to do everything as far as it depends on me to live at peace, regardless of the other person's actions. It's not as far as it depends on how kind and receptive and reasonable the other person is being. It's as far as it depends on you. Your actions and your responses are the ones that matter here. And two, this verse acknowledges that we are often one of the biggest sources of conflict in our own lives. You might think, what? That's not true, Megan. I'm a very peaceful person. I never contribute to conflict. It's all those other crazy people out there. Perhaps. Um, but I'd like to explore three different conflict creators that may make you feel a little differently at the end. Oftentimes, if we simply change how we approach and engage with conflict, we often find that the amount of negative conflict and discord in our life suddenly drastically reduces, even though other people haven't changed at all. 
Peace with everyone often depends on you. Okay, so let's look at this first conflict creator, assumptions. Now assumptions are when we guess the reason or motive behind an action that we're not sure about. For example, maybe my friend Louise doesn't text me back after I invite her out to coffee. Now there are a multitude of reasons why she might have done this, and I don't know the real reason because I'm not her, but I can guess. I can assume that she doesn't really want to get coffee with me, and that's why she didn't text me back. I can assume that she is mad at me for something and is trying to subtly let me know by the silent treatment. Or I can assume that she's like me, and she doesn't check her phone after 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and her phone's probably dead. Now, assumptions are dangerous because when we assume things we don't know, we unconsciously believe lies about other people. I cannot know why someone did something or didn't do something because I'm not that person. I don't know their inner thoughts, motivations, or reasons, the whole story behind what's going on. And when I assume something about them, I am potentially believing a lie and responding on that lie. If I assume that Louise didn't text me back because she doesn't actually want to get coffee with me, my responses and actions are then flavored by that assumption. I might avoid her at church the next week because I'm embarrassed she didn't want to hang out with me. I may feel angry towards her for not wanting to pursue a friendship with me. When one of my other friends talks to me about getting together with Louise, I may roll my eyes and say, yeah, Louise, she's just really hard to get to know. She just doesn't respond. She doesn't um, really want to get back to you. She's really limited in who she has friends with. I'm perpetuating the lie that I'm believing about Louise to other people. When I make assumptions about people, I may unintentionally believe a lie about them, and this violates God's command to not bear false witness against each other. Exodus 20:16 says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. I may think that I know the reasons why someone does something. I may think that I'm that logical and that intuitive and that, well, really, it's the only obvious reason. But the truth is, I don't know, and I need to be humble enough to recognize that. When I make assumptions about other people and their actions, I create discord. I perpetuate conflict and escalate conflict instead of resolving it. Now, when we're faced with this conflict, an action that we're not sure about, we have two choices. We can choose the path of discord or we can choose the path of peace. In the area of assumptions, we choose the path of discord by assuming the worst. When my friend makes a sarcastic comment when we're hanging out, I can choose to assume he's mad at me. I can choose to assume he's trying to show off for our other friends. I can choose to assume that he's just not a very nice person. I can choose the path of discord and assume the worst about him, which then perpetuates a small lie. Or I can choose the path of peace by either A, checking out my assumption, or B, assuming the best. If I decide to check out my assumption, instead of guessing a reason as to why my friend did or didn't do a particular thing, all I do is ask them, so, when Louise doesn't text me back about coffee, instead of assuming the worst about her and her motives, I can stop and recognize, you know, I don't know the reason why she didn't text me back, so I shouldn't make one up in my head. Next time I see her, I'll check out my assumption and say, hey Louise, I texted you earlier this week about coffee, but I didn't hear back from you. Is everything okay? And then Louise tells me either, oh yeah, I'm so sorry about that. I thought I had hit send and I didn't. I'd love to get coffee with you. Or she might say, oh yeah, I was really mad at you and that's why I didn't text you back. Her reason for the action may be positive or negative, but that ultimately doesn't matter when I choose how to respond to her initial behavior. As far as it depends on me, I will choose the path of peace, which is to check out my assumptions before believing potential lies. Now we don't necessarily get the luxury of checking out our assumptions in every conflict. Um, in cases like these, where we don't have the ability to actually talk to the person, we need to choose the path of peace and assume the best about their motives and intentions. It ultimately doesn't matter whether the guy cut me off in traffic because he's a jerk, or if the guy cut me off in traffic because he's distracted because he just found out that his daughter was diagnosed with cancer. It does matter, however, to my state of mind and my subsequent reactions and thoughts. When I assume the best about people in my head instead of slandering them in my head, my mood is better. I'm more gracious. I'm more forgiving. I feel lighter. 
I find that when I promote peace by assuming the best, my life has more joy. When you can't check out an assumption with someone, choose the path of peace and simply assume the best instead of the worst. Psalm 15, two, three, two through three tells us, the one whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others. When you find yourself in conflict created by assumptions, choose the path of peace. Check out your assumptions or assume the best instead of the path of discord, assuming the worst and not checking out your assumptions. So our second conflict creator is very similar to assumptions, but it's kind of a bigger deal. Um, and this is something that we call faulty filters. So faulty filters are the stories that we tell ourselves in our heads that have to do with the broken narratives that we've made up about our lives. All of us have different faulty fil filters. These lies that we perhaps unknowingly believe about ourselves, about the world, about God, and about others. And these subconscious lies influence how we interpret different situations and interactions with others. Here are some examples of some different common faulty filters. Um, I want you guys to see if you recognize any of these for yourself. I'm unlovable. Nothing will ever change. I'm the victim. Everyone hates me. I'm not worth spending time with. It's all or nothing. Nobody respects me. I'm not doing enough. People are selfish. Everyone's mad at me. I can't do this. No one trusts me. They don't believe in me. My life is hard. These are different faulty filters, different lies that some of us have internalized about our own stories and our own narratives, but they're simply not true. Let's take a look at a friendship in the Bible that was profoundly impacted by negatively interacting with faulty filters. Last week, Ryan talked about the friendship between David and Jonathan, um, and we learned a little bit about Jonathan's father, this guy named Saul. Now, while David and Jonathan, in the midst of building this beautiful friendship with one another, Saul is trying to kill David. Um, but it wasn't always that way. How did this relationship get so broken and so full of discord? In 1 Samuel 18, we see where Saul first starts to choose the path of discord in his relationship with David. David continued to succeed in everything he did, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. That seems small, right? Not a lot of stuff in there. He's not yet chucking spears at David. But this is the start of where things go wrong between them. Because we see that Saul is choosing to interpret this conflict in a very particular way. David is becoming successful. Saul could be happy about that, like his son Jonathan is. Saul could not care at all about that. Why does it matter to him at all whether or not David is successful? But the Bible doesn't tell us that Saul is happy. It doesn't tell us that he's indifferent. It tells us that he is afraid. He chooses to interpret David's success as personally negative for him. And this is because Saul is interpreting the situation through his own broken narrative. Let's go back a little further, way before Saul ever met David, and get some insight on this faulty filter he's using to interpret the world. Then the prophet Samuel said to Saul, stop, listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you? Saul asked. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. Although you may think little of yourself. The prophet Samuel hits the nail on the head. This is Saul's faulty filter that he's using to interpret all of his interactions in the world. He thinks little of himself. His self-esteem is really low. He has a lot of insecurities about himself. He thinks, I'm not good enough. I'm not important. I'm insignificant. And this is a lie that Saul has believed about himself for a really, really long time. If we go back even further in Saul's story, when we very first meet him in the Bible, Saul runs into the prophet Samuel, who tells him that he'll be the king of Israel. Samuel said, I'm here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. Saul replied, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking like this to me? 
When we look more deeply into Saul's internal world, we realize that the story he has been telling himself his whole life is that he's not good enough, that he's unworthy, and that he's small and insignificant. And it is through this faulty filter that he interprets all of his interactions with David. That is why when he recognized that David is becoming successful, Saul is not happy, he's not indifferent, but he's afraid because his jealousy and his own feelings of inadequacy flavor how he views his relationship with David. Rather than confronting his own faulty filters and recognizing how they are influencing his misjudgments and misinterpretations of David, Saul lashes out at David and turns a friendship into lifelong animosity. When we engage with conflict, we have the choice of either the path of discord, filtering interactions through our own broken narratives, or the path of peace, recognizing our faulty filters and checking them out with the story I'm telling myself. So I went home a couple months ago to hang out with my mom, and while we were there one night, I was feeding my son Roland at the dinner table. I don't remember what he was eating. Maybe it was Cheerios or oatmeal, maybe it was blueberries. But my mom made an offhand comment like, when is he going to start using a spoon? Or is he always going to eat with his fingers? Something like that. Now, all of a sudden, I felt this prick in my heart. And I recognized that this comment really bothered me for some reason. I didn't say anything. We cleaned up dinner and we went to watch TV together. But I noticed that my mood was quickly deteriorating and that I was really hurt. <coughs> now, at this point, I had two choices. I could choose the path of discord, or I could choose the path of peace. Now, I'm not great at conflict, um, and in the past, I had always chosen the path of discord in situations like this. Choosing to view these interactions through my own faulty filter of I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing it right, I should do more. These are the lies of my broken narrative, things that I subconsciously internalize about myself. And I could have let those lies flavor how I interpreted what my mom said. I could easily perceive her comment as a slight on my parenting, her subtly criticizing how I was raising Roland, that I wasn't doing it right, that I should have given him spoons sooner, that he was behind. Maybe she was criticizing how I was raising Roland. But the comment hurt me more because it was being interpreted through these deep-seated lies that I had about myself. I could have withdrawn and retreated from her and been angry in my angry in my head at her for insulting my parenting and not done anything about it. But that would have been the path of discord, choosing to filter interactions through my <laughs> faulty filters, my broken narrative. So this time, instead of withdrawing, thinking that I knew how my mom meant that comment and believing lies about her, I chose the path of peace. I recognized that I was employing a faulty filter. Now, one of the main ways that I can tell um, that there's a faulty filter in play is when my reaction or level of hurt seems disproportionate to what has happened. I have to stop and get curious. Why did that comment about spoons hurt my feelings so much? Was it actually a judgmental comment? Or is there something deeper going on here in my own feelings, some insecurity or lie that I'm feeding into? I stopped and checked my own internal emotional world and recognized that there was a faulty filter sneaking in here that was flavoring how I interpreted my mom's comment. It bothered me so much because it played into the lies of I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing it right. Once I recognized that I had brought this faulty filter into the interaction, I then needed to check it out with my mom. So this is a tool that author and researcher Brene Brown recommends and it's called The Story I'm Telling Myself. And basically, you acknowledge the faulty filter that you're bringing into an interaction, admitting how it has flavored your interpretation, and you check it out with the other person. So that evening, I pulled my mom aside and I told her about the spoon comment. I said, the story I'm telling myself when he made that comment about the spoons is that you don't think I'm parenting Roland right or that I'm not doing a good enough job. I admit my own weakness and brokenness that I'm bringing into the conflict, and I humbly ask for clarification and understanding of what the true narrative is, because I'm having a hard time recognizing it in the middle of my own brokenness. And of course, my mom did not at all mean that she doesn't think I'm a good mom. That was me. That was my broken narrative coming into the conflict. By using the story I'm telling myself, I was able to admit my part in this conflict to my mom and resolve the conflict. 
because I got clarity on the truth, what was actually going on. And I restored the relationship by diffusing lies that I was believing about my mom. Now this may seem like a really minor example, but it is these small, seemingly unimportant little interactions that build up over time and create a web of lies and misunderstandings and larger conflicts that fizzle out friendships and erode relationships. By catching and recognizing our faulty filters early in these small interactions and in bigger interactions, we keep our friendships in the truth. 1 John 1.6 says, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. When we are walking in fellowship with others, yet choose to interpret interactions and conflicts through our own broken narrative and faulty filters, we walk in darkness and we are living a lie. Just like Saul did with David, just like I did with my mom. Choose the path of peace and recognize that your fault, recognize your faulty filters and then check them out with the story I'm telling myself. So the last conflict creator we're going to take a look at is called expectations. Expectations are strong beliefs that something will be happen. Can be small, like I'm expecting that my roommate and I will watch The Bachelor tonight when I get home. Or it can be bigger, like I'm expecting that my friends will throw me a birthday party in two weeks for my birthday. When our expectations are disappointed or not met, we have conflict. So it's important to navigate expectations well in order to promote peace instead of discord. So there are two kinds of expectations, valid ones and invalid ones. So for an expectation to be valid, i.e. you can legitimately feel upset when it's not met, author Peter Scazzaro tells it has to meet four critical criteria. Number one, your expectation must be conscious. You have to actually know what you're expecting. Um, oftentimes, we're not even aware that we have an expectation until it gets violated. So for instance, Louise agrees to coffee to me, um, and I show up, and lo and behold, Millie's there. I'm like, what? I was so upset. I thought that I was expecting that it would just be Louise and me going to get coffee, but Louise brought Millie with her, and now I'm feeling upset. I was not conscious of my expectation of having a private lunch with Louise with just the two of us until it was violated. Number two, your expectation must be realistic. Now we can have many expectations that are not feasible or reasonable. For example, you may have an expectation that your friend Milo will text you back within three minutes of you texting him. This is probably not a realistic expectation and your expectation needs to be adjusted. If you feel like your expectation is realistic, but the other person doesn't feel like it's realistic, it's not realistic. Number three, your expectation must be spoken. So this is the hard one for most of us. We expect people to be mind readers. This is an unrealistic expectation because no one can read someone else's mind. Well, it's obvious, you say, they should just know. Or if they really, really cared about me and loved me, they would know that this is what I want. We like to think that our thoughts and our feelings about the world are immeasurably obvious and transparent to our friends, but the truth is they're not. Just like we can't assume to know the internal world of someone else in assumptions, we can't expect someone else to know our internal world either. People aren't mind readers. You have to tell them. And these spoken expectations also have to be clear and straightforward. I might say to my husband, Ryan, hey, I'm headed up to bed and think that I have spoken my expectation that he will then follow me and come to bed with me. But I have not. I have merely hinted at what I wanted, and I am still expecting him to fill in the gaps of what I want and need. In order to have actually expressed my expectations so that it is valid, I need to say, hey, Ryan, I'm headed up to bed right now, and I would like you to come with me so we can go to bed together. Now this then gives the other person a chance to fulfill the final requirement of a valid expectation. It must be agreed upon. Until the other person has agreed to your expectation, it is still not valid. Um, and it's really hard for someone to agree to something that you haven't actually like told them. So that's why number three is really important. So I've spoken my expectation to Ryan in a clear, straightforward way. And he can then say, yes, let me turn off the Xbox and I will be up in five minutes. Or he can say, no, I'm sorry, I can't yet. I still have to kill 500 aliens. <laughs> 
<laughs> at which point we can then negotiate our expectations. <laughs> so, if an expectation of yours fails to meet any of these four criteria, conscious, realistic, spoken, agreed upon, it is not a valid expectation. You will probably still feel disappointed and upset when your invalid expectation is not met. But at that point, you know that the fault for it disappearing, being disappointed lies on you because you did not clearly express and communicate your expectation and get it gotten it agreed to. Now, when we fail to form valid expectations and then lash out and become angry or become upset because of that, we choose the path of discord. But when we identify how fault lies with us in conflicts over disappointed expectations and then choose to form valid expectations instead, we choose the path of peace. Let's take a look at a pair in the Bible who have conflict over expectations. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come help me. So who has an expectation that is being disappointed? Martha. She's expecting that Mary will help her with dinner, and Mary doesn't, so now she's upset. And the Bible doesn't tell us whether or not Martha's expectation was valid, so let's see what Martha would have needed to do in order for her to feel justifiably disappointed when Mary didn't meet her expectation. Number one, conscious. Did Martha realize that she was expecting Mary to help her with dinner? Two, realistic. Is it reasonable for Martha to expect Mary to help her with dinner? Maybe Mary doesn't get home until really, really late at night. Maybe Mary usually helps Martha with dinner, so it's a pretty reasonable expectation. Maybe Mary is really close to Jesus, and so it's not super realistic to ask her to spend any time. So maybe it's not super realistic for her to ask um, Mary to spend time in the kitchen instead of with Jesus for the limited time that he's here. Number three, spoken. Did Martha ever say to Mary, hey, Mary, since we're having Jesus and his disciples over tonight for dinner, I need some more help in the kitchen. I was unconsciously expecting you to help me make dinner, but I realized that I hadn't asked you, I asked you yet. So I wanted to check with you and see if that's something I can expect. And number four, agreed upon. And then after Martha expressed her expectation, did Mary then say, yes, of course, I will be happy to help you make dinner. Or did she say, I'm really sorry, Martha, but I had already been planning that I would spend the whole evening with Jesus because I don't see him that often. Can you find someone else to help you at dinner, please? Now, if all four of these criteria were met, if Martha had a conscious, realistic, spoken, agreed upon expectation with Mary that she would help her cook dinner, then Mary can justifiably feel, then Martha can justifiably be upset when this expectation is violated. However, because in the next couple verses, Jesus rebukes Martha, I'm probably going to bet that this was an invalid expectation that Martha maybe never told Mary her expectation and that Mary never agreed to it. In this case, the fault for the conflict is on Martha. And so she probably needs to go to Mary afterwards and pursue the path of peace, saying, hey, Mary, I'm really sorry that I got upset at you earlier today about dinner. I had unconsciously been expecting you to help me, but I never expressed that to you. And so it's unfair of me to get mad at you. Will you please forgive me? When we pursue the path of peace and express our expectations instead of pursuing the path of discord and getting mad about disappointed, invalid expectations, we speak the truth and love and mature in our relationships and friendships. Ephesians 4.15 says, instead speaking the truth and love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And many different things, situations, and people can create conflict. But unfortunately and fortunately, we are often the source of most of our conflict. We make assumptions about others. We use our faulty filters and broken narrative to interpret the world and our interactions with others. We leave expectations unexpressed and then get mad about it. We cannot control other people or what they do, but we can control ourselves. And we can control whether we choose the path of peace or the path of discord when we engage with assumptions, faulty filters, and expectations. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Instead of assuming the worst about others and their motives, check out your assumptions or assume the best. This will keep you from unconsciously slandering others in your head or to other people, and it lets your heart be light and full of joy. Instead of interpreting interactions through your broken scripts and the deeply embedded lies of your narrative, begin to recognize when faulty filters are affecting how you view something. Admit the narrative that you carry into your interactions by using the story I'm telling myself is, and check out these faulty filters with others. This will allow you to live in the truth instead of darkness. Instead of getting mad about violated expectations that were not valid, Take responsibility for not clearly expressing your expectations and then form valid expectations the next time around. Realize them, make them realistic, express them clearly and straightforwardly, and then seek agreement. This will make your interactions loving, respectful, and more mature in Christ. Now, friendships with others is one of the greatest gifts that we have as human beings because God recognized the goodness of humans not being alone. But if we fail to engage with conflict well and navigate the normal, natural differences between human beings, we will not have friends. Our friendships will be surface level. They will be short-lived. They will be unsatisfying. And we are called to so much more than that. Let's be people of peace. Not fake peace, where we pretend that we understand what other people are thinking, or when we pretend that our feelings aren't coming to play, or when we pretend that things aren't hurtful or disappointing when they are. Let's be people of true peace, people who live in the truth and the light, who engage in the difficulty of conflict and the broken ways of relating that we bring into conflict so that we can experience deep love both for and from other people in God. Let's pray. Lord, this area of conflict is really hard for most of us. Um, it's something that we're often not taught how to deal with well in our families. Um, something that a lot of us shy away from. Um, but we know that as people trying to pursue you and to love you and love others well, that this area is really important um, and that we need to take steps in our own ways of relating with others to address conflict. Um, please provide us insight on how we're making assumptions about others, how our faulty filters are coming into play, how our expectations are contributing to conflict so that we be can begin to address these and then live lives that are more peaceful and more joyful and more reflective of you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>